coming to the wonderful February meeting of the Southern California Writers Association. We've been in a Writers Association since 1981. And uh, that's pretty good, huh? We've had everybody here from Ray Bradbury to you name it. So um, we're just honored that everybody makes it today. We're gonna have, you're going to be delighted today. We put on a little uh, jazz for you to start with, just because our speaker today also is a musician and plays drums. So you get uh, if not only his work and wisdom, but you'll get to get some rhythm. And um, you'll hear something. And I want to get some of you up and see how you move. Because you know? I think some of you need to shake a little and get a little in there. Where's Nanette? Nanette. All right, we were saying we haven't danced since uh, Diana's birthday last time. And we need to get back out there. And we, they, we closed that bar down. They said, hey, get out. And we said, we're writers, and we're going to write about you. And they said, all right. They stayed open and let us party some more. So um, that was a lot of fun. So you are you have some rhythm, uh, I do say that. But we're having a great month, and we have a lot of great stuff uh, going on. By the way, if you haven't seen out there the cake with all the different colors on it, that is traditional cake from the Mardi Gras. And it's a wonderful cake, and it's really good. Uh, it's a sweet bread cake, and it's just wonderful. Usually they have a baby Jesus in it, but they stopped with the baby Jesus. Uh, for us, they gave us one without it. <laughs> we don't have that. And, uh, but how many uh, men here are past 10 years old? Raise your hand. <laughs> I heard a newscaster say this morning that we're past our prime. All right? When you're 10 and a man, you're over. You know? So... Go figure. Women, it's 50 or 40, whatever it was, but for men, it's 10. So I guess we're never all going to get together again, you know, uh, however it goes. Anybody leave their coffee on the bar out there? I guess it was mine. Then. <laughs> Notice nobody would leave a drink on the bar. <laughs> I, um, let's welcome Maddie Margarita, hey. who on Wednesday, you can see her every Wednesday live. And hear writers and everything telling about their upcoming work. Maddie. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Larry. That, that's hard to live up to. I'm actually mostly live on Wednesday, you know, depending on the time. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Uh, I meet a lot of writers and talk to a lot of people. Um, and unlike uh, Don Lemon, who says that women over 50 are past their prime. Uh, I'll let you know when I get there. Um, uh, I am a good judge of character, and he is, he is a great guy. Um, Jonathan Brown is a Canadian drummer. Uh, he's an author. He's a personal trainer, and he's an all-around great person to be around. He's the author of the Lou Crasher series. You know, I've done this a few times. I don't even have to look at my notes. Yeah, I love it. Uh, let me, I, but I want to get the order right. So we have uh, The Big Crescendo is the first Lou Crasher novel. Um, Don't Shoot the Drummer is the second. And then uh, Drums, Guns, and Money is the most recent, right? Yes, correct. And he's also the author of his new Chloe series featuring a female protagonist. So he's in touch with all of his sides. Yeah. Uh, so we're in, I'm interested to uh, read that. Uh, he also wrote, uh, what, is it a biography on like Vince yep, Lombardi? Like historical fiction. Yeah. Historical fiction uh, about Vince Lombardi and also the book on, who is the boxer? Angelo Dundee. Angelo, Angelo Dundee. So he writes everything. He is what I call a res uh, renaissance man. He's um, also inspirational, and he was kind enough to bring his lovely wife Sonia with uh, him here today. Um, so we have the, the full team here. So um, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Jonathan Brown. Yeah.
that is an African uh, djembe, that drum. Uh, a lot of bands use it in uh, West Africa. And uh, many years ago, I was I played drum set in what they called an African high life band, which is very up tempo, and we always had a djembe player and a dancer, and they would often do take do their solos together. Now that drum really has nothing to do with this talk today, but I felt you, you're in the theater uh, and you're such lovely looking people. I thought you should be entertained, <laughs> so it really doesn't relate. <laughs> Okay, so when Maddie invited me down here, um, I have this policy of just saying yes, even if something scares the uh, you-know-what out of me, like public speaking. And then I think a few days after that, I said, oh yeah, what are we talking about? Are you going to interview me? Or, and you said, just come down and be inspirational. <laughs> and I said, oh, that old thing. <laughs> so... Um, Yes, I am Jonathan Brown, but now if maybe you can't see it, but there's an uh, initial J in there. So I am now Jonathan J. Brown, which is my middle name uh, is James. So it's not uh, pretension that I add that. It's that somebody who knows a lot more about Amazon and algorithms said there's too many Jonathan Browns. I don't know why everybody wants to be Jonathan Brown. And it's too hard to find me and my work. So I said, okay, let's throw an initial in there, and now I pop up more quickly. Well, we shall see. <laughs> so at, at first I thought Amazon just didn't like me, but actually, <laughs> there's an... You could be JJ. I could be JJ, <laughs> JJ Brown. So this book that Maddie talked about is in my Lou Crasher series, and it's actually my eighth novel. And... Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, do you, is, are you familiar with the author Harlan Coben? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I met him at a conference, and uh, uh, it just—he's—I I love his books, and he's a—he's very inspirational speaker himself. And I knew that he played a high level of basketball at college, I guess. So after, when I got to—I courted him at this conference, and I said, "Do you find that your discipline?" with your output of novels uh, is tied to the fact that you played a high level of basketball, you know, the discipline, working out, exercise. And he said, no. And I thought, well, I've got nothing else. <laughs> I said, thank you for your time, Mr. Cohen. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> about an hour later, um, I don't know how, but I found myself at the bar. And he came up to me and he goes, you know what? I've been thinking about your question. And you're right. I, uh, my discipline comes from, I just didn't think about that, but yeah, God, I think about those early workouts and, and, and the practices and the diet, and it's like, oh, man. And yeah, that's why I don't even think of writing as that takes discipline. I said, it's also because you love it, right? And he said, yeah. And he goes, for th so thanks for bringing that up. So I consider that a win. <laughs> I said, you're welcome, Mr. Coben. <laughs> So one of the, another thing that he said, um, I had written, I had self-published my second book at that time. And I told him about it and uh, he said, well, just keep going. He goes, I didn't make it. Uh, nobody knew who I was until my 10th novel. I said, really? I said, Mr. Coben, I'm going to do it in five. <laughs> so this is my eighth and uh, I had to put a J in my name. <laughs> so maybe by 10. But the funny thing is, it has, when I started out, yes, we all have that dream of, what if this one book goes viral, as they say. Uh, that thinking and that dream and that hope is, is long gone because w the real reward is writing itself. I absolutely love it. And I came, I came late to the game because I started playing drums at 10 years old and was pursuing the rock and roll dream. I went to music school, played in the clubs and all that stuff. And um, <clears throat> it started, nightclubs, uh, live music started to change. The kids coming up behind us were no longer really interested in live music. Uh, DJs were coming along and rap music. You know, I was becoming a dinosaur and also I was losing 
the passion for hustling for gigs. I really just enjoy teaching and staying home and playing. So I thought, well, let, let, you know, since self-publishing came along, I thought, well, let me try to write a book. And I remember, I don't know what your experience was when you started writing, but <clears throat> I remember I it was probably 40,000 words into my first draft of my first novel, and I met this guy at a party, and he had uh, just got his master's in literature or something like that. And he probably spent 20 minutes telling me, you're never going to be a writer if you don't have any education. I mean, you went to music school, and, and he just kept going. And I, I was literally looking for a camera, because I said, this guy can't be, this guy can't be for real. And he's like, I, he goes, no offense. And we all know that yeah. when people say no offense, here comes the offense. <laughs> he goes, I just don't think you have it in you. I don't think you can do it. And then he added a no offense at the end. And I thought of something that the comedian Ricky Gervais said. He says, the type of humor I like is when um, there's an asshole. Everyone knows he's an asshole, but the asshole doesn't know he's an asshole. <laughs> And I thought, oh, here's that guy Ricky Gervais is talking about. <laughs> so, uh, 2013, I self-published my first book, 2015 my second, and then I thought, okay, um, I might have something here because, you know, family and friends and even acquaintances were saying, hey, not bad. So I thought, okay, just like sports that I used to do or drums, you just have to keep doing it over and over and over until you get better. So I thought, well, I need some help with this. So I uh, found an editor and she took my first book and we, we uh, reworked it and it was called Crescendo. So that is the big crescendo. Let me explain that. So wrote Crescendo, gave it to this editor and she said, um, there's a lot of good stuff here, and there's a few things you need to know about mystery itself. Because I decided, okay, I will be a mystery writer. So um, <clears throat> she said, the good news is your 100,000 word book uh, can be busted up into two books. She said, take the front half, rewrite it, add some stuff, and then let's go hunt for an agent. So I thought, okay, this is great. Uh, her name is Elaine Ash, and she uh, edits in mystery and she's written in mystery so I always believe go to those who know go to those who have wisdom or who, who are further down the road than you are and um, so long as when people come up behind you you help them as well that's how I look at it so I uh, didn't get the uh, uh, I didn't get the agent but I, I landed a, a small publisher called down and out books and I wanted to keep the crescendo in there because it's like the climax of music and it makes sense for the story and the character. And many, many years ago, I went to a book signing that with, um, thanks honey, uh, Michael Connolly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got, I bought his, I, he was at a Borders bookstore, sadly they're gone. And I walked in there, saw his picture, said, oh, he's going to be here tomorrow. So I grabbed his book and I read it all day, read it overnight. And he was giving his, his talk. And then everyone started to line up for the signing. And I still had, you know, four or five pages left to go. And I had asked him a question during his talk about, you know, what do you recommend for a guy starting out? And he said, get yourself an agent. Um, it's, just make sure your manuscript is really tight and keep going. So I was the last one in line and um, he was waiting for me. I still had like a page to go. So I'm standing over him like, uh, the end. I said, great book, Mr. Connolly. So he signed it and he didn't look up and he said, um, what's the name of your book? And I, and I wasn't sure I, if it was going to be Crescendo or something like Fired Up. And I thought, no, that's too much Jerry Bruckheimer or Michael Bay. So, so I said, Crescendo. And he didn't look up, he signed it. I got, when I left, I got my book and he said, um, can't wait to read Crescendo. Oh, wow. So I thought, okay, I have to keep the name. Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, what is better than Crescendo? What is more, more grand? What is you, big, I called it, the big Crescendo. <laughs> 
Very clever on my part. <laughs> so yeah, this is my third book. So Lou Crasher is a uh, rock and roll drummer in Los Angeles who um, keeps one foot in rock and roll and the other foot he becomes an amateur PI just because of his sense, strong sense of right and wrong. So he, he often gets in over his head, puts himself in danger for doing what he thinks is right while still keeping the, the music going. And like as I said earlier, this is book number eight that I've written. And uh, what's that expression, if you want to make God laugh, uh, tell him your plans. So I, I uh, at the end of every year, I don't really do New Year's, New Year's resolution, but I will look at my, you know, my day timer, because I still have a physical day timer, and I look at the entire year, and I look at um, how much my wife and I traveled, how many books I wrote, or the word output, exercise, all that stuff. And I think, okay, I need next year to be better than the previous year. How can I do that? So <clears throat> I was ready in January to hit the ground running. I was going to try to put out two books a year. And I had all the stuff set to go, do yoga, all that stuff. And then I started having like an issue with my eye. It was like uh, vertigo or something crazy going on. Then I had stuff going on with my sinuses, and then I had uh, just a wicked headache. And I've always prided myself on having a really strong, uh, keen sense of body awareness. And, uh, and I'm not the type to run to the doctor at the first sign of trouble. I can count how many times I've taken antibiotics on one hand. But this just was not right. So I went to the doc and said, this is what's going on. And the doctor said, yeah, I'm looking at your chart and this just uh, doesn't seem right. Let's, let's take an x-ray because of these headaches. And they found a mass in my head. So I was like, oh, God, but what about, what about my plans, you know? <laughs> so um, right off the bat, uh, I thought, oh, great, this is probably uh, a brain tumor. And uh, so they said, now we did the x-ray, we need to do an MRI to really figure it out and do more blood and all the tests and all that stuff. And even though that was potentially b bad news, at least I had an answer. I was like, okay, now we know what this is and what's the plan? So I went in full with horse blinders on, business mode. Uh, I believe in science, so okay, doc, tell me what I need to do. And it turned out that I have what's called multiple myeloma, which is in the leukemia family. I think there's four of them. And it's a blood bone marrow cancer. And one thing I learned uh, is that the uh, neurosurgeon said, um, no matter what type of cancer, whether it's lung, liver, whatever it is, any cancer can jump from the body to the skull. So you, in fact, don't have a brain tumor, it's, this is the multiple myeloma, so we got a, a, on a program with chemo and all that stuff. They said chemo six months and then <clears throat> uh, we'll do a bone, nah, thank you, stem cell transplant. I said okay, uh, I'm up for all that. And in the beginning you know you <clears throat> start, you know you have to let your friends and family know, so I'm texting people and still have, you know, this lingering headache. And I think I got to my third text, and I said, there is no way I'm going to sit here and frigging text people for the next six months <laughs> because I don't like the text language anyway. So I said to my wife, I'll be right back. And I went out to our studio where we have a gym, have my drums, and I built a desk and I write. I set up my phone and I put, did a video one minute and let people know what's happening and I stuck it on Facebook and Instagram because that's where I am. And people said, you know, what they should, the, the standard, sorry to hear that, hang in there, stay strong, and thank you for sharing that with us. And then I thought, okay, I'll just use video to let people know what's happening because I would get some personal phone calls and they'd say, What's really great about that is we can see you, and we can see how you're doing, and um, 
people started to say, you know, your videos are quite inspirational. And I thought, I never thought of myself as inspirational. What do you mean? They said, well, your attitude is so positive. And that really gives us strength. And I mean, cancer, I'm sure, has touched everyone in this room. I'm sure you know somebody or lost somebody or uh, I know I, I know I have. So I thought, okay, then, and then they said, well, how do you stay so positive? And um, I thought about that question and I thought, well, I was a positive person before I was diagnosed and this is a cancer battle and I think it's a battle on every levels. So there's no way cancer is going to take my positivity away. That's, uh-uh, that's mine. And I'm not going to sit here and say, poor me, and be bitter and all that stuff. So I had the love and support of family and friends, mostly from my wife. I, I, I wouldn't be standing here if, if not for my wife, Sonia. So we had the love and support. Then we had the science, and the chemo was working. And the, and the positive attitude... Um, was easy because I had heard the horror stories about chemo and how awful it is. Like, I don't care if I lose my hair, you know. But, <laughs> but there was no nausea and uh, everything went great. I still exercised. I didn't actually work out seven days a week. I never missed a single day. It was just definitely modified and sometimes only 15 minutes. But um, So I literally woke up every morning excited that I woke up in the morning because I had no idea how this was going to go. I'm like, oh, I'm back. And the other thing which ties into writing is this is our passion and we choose to do this. I, you know, I'm not getting rich off it. Maybe you are. <laughs> so um, I was supposed to do six months of chemo, but we got it done in about four and a half. And when, when I'd go in for my treatment, I was uh, usually under the IV, but I call it the feed bag. I was under the feed bag for four, either four hours or six hours. And I would just take my notebook and I would write by hand. So I was like, oh, I still get to have this passion. And on the days when I wasn't feeling great, I would look forward to, oh, once I get up from this bed, I'm going to write. And a couple of the drugs I was on... Uh, they would give you just insomnia that you just could not, there's no sleep. So rather than, you know, whine about it, I would just sit back and I would write in my head. I'd write out all the scenes so that when I felt good in the morning, uh, I would just keep going. And the other thing that really helped was, I think sometimes you sometimes you get ready for a fight that you don't know is coming. Because the year before I was diagnosed with that, I put myself on a yoga challenge. I said, I'm going to do yoga 365 days in a row. And even if it's, you know, a minimum of uh, 20 minutes. I don't know, I just wanted to see if I could do it. And so I got through, I did that, and I thought in case I missed a day, which, which I didn't, I did 366 days. So I broke my own goal by one day. <laughs> then I wrote, um, I'd written Chloe and g given it to the publisher, and they were late getting it back to me. But when they did, I was going through the cancer, and I had to go through the, the edits and the notes that they gave me. I was also writing this book, Drums, Guns, and Money, because I have this thing, and I say to my wife, I. You know, when you're a kid, you have a like imaginary friends. Well, as a, as a grown man, I have an imaginary a hundred thousand <clears throat> fans all over the world that are dying to read my books. So I kept telling myself, I don't care if I'm going through this cancer. I need output. I need to keep books out there. I, I want to make it seamless. And uh, people might say, Oh, he had cancer in 2022. But how did he have a book come out in June and then one in March of the next year? Because I, hearkening back to Harlan Coben, I looked at it like this is a sport, this is a challenge, me against cancer. And I'm just going to, I always believe in forward momentum, just keep moving. Nothing was going to hold me down. 
although there were days where I was definitely held down. <laughs> but um, you just often say, this too shall pass, right? And I remember having a conversation with my wife, and she said, she goes, I just don't understand it. We eat organic, exercise every day, you're healthy. Why you? And I said, oh, why not me? Because one thing I like, which is, um, I guess it's in all the good books, but I like how the Buddhists have this attitude, you know, the smiling Buddha knows that there are, in life there's going to be ups and downs. And if you think the downs aren't going to happen to you, you're ignorant or arrogant. <laughs> so if, if stuff happens to you, it's, it's that thing called life. So uh, just recognize it when it's there or when it's here, and fight through it. That's, that, was my, that was my approach, mm -hmm. and it worked. And um, also being a cup is half full kind of guy, I have to say um, there's a lot of good that came out of it because as far as my writing, exercise, and personal training, I think I found that I was coasting. I was jogging at a pretty good clip, and I... As I was under the feed bag for hours, I thought, when I get through this, I'm definitely going to, I want to do more appearances. Thank you, Maddie. Like this. I want to, I always write two books at the same time. So I, I but I'd like to actually get two books out a year. I took on audiobook narration, worked with a coach, and uh, just more output, more time with my wife, more walks, more dinners where we sit at the table instead of in, in front of Netflix. And, uh, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> so it's been working out great. Is this inspirational at all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I get into the books and all that, are there any questions at this point? Yes. Okay. How does one focus on one story while they're writing another story? Do you start getting your plots mixed up and your character mixed up? And okay. So she, she's asked, how do you write two stories at once without getting the plot, plots mixed up? Or, uh, and this, I love that question because this came about when I, I think, yeah, I wrote the big crescendo, gave it to the publisher, and I got the email back saying, this is great. We should be launching in a year. I'm like, well, now what do I do? <laughs> I, okay, start the next book. So I hated that waiting period. So what I do now is I might get, um, if I have a 70,000 word book that I'm shooting for, I'll wait till I get to about 50,000 words, and then I'll go start the other book, even if, even if it's just that outlining the other book. So I, I always have the other book behind the other book that I'm almost finished, the first draft. And I, I like that stagger because um, we have to wait on publishers and, and editors because uh, even though I'm with a small publisher, they have a lot of writers and you're just, now you're standing in line. And I just want to, you know, I feel I was, I'm very late to this game because I played drums for many years, but I didn't really get my first book out until 2013, and, you know, I'm in my 40s, and I thought, ah, I should have been doing this, you know, in the 80s, but I didn't have the confidence back then, and I was pursuing music. But, yes, to answer your question, I have one that I'm almost finished, and I have the next one behind it, and uh, all those ideas that we have, oh, this might be a good idea, I always... I have a folder on my laptop, and I put all those ideas down, working title, and then like a loose outline. And if there's any time where, not writer's block, but I'm just taking a break on a certain story, I'll go to those and start building up those outlines so they're ready to go, like in a factory. And, uh, but no, I... Um, with, with the Lou Crasher character, I really know the character because some people would say he's loosely based on me. <laughs> so I know that character very well. So it's, I won't get those plots confused because this time he's doing this, last time he was doing that. 
And my stories usually start out with something small and innocent in the music world. And then sometimes there's something big, like a government thing or something bigger going. So I often pick the big event that the book is going to have. So, uh, and then at, in that way, I just start small, get big to the big crescendo. And uh, I think the stories are different enough that I don't get them confused. Especially when, as Maddie said, I did two books that were historical fiction. So it's easy to keep, you know, Vince Lombardi separate from Chloe, which is... <laughs> um, I just want to talk for a minute, because you, you write historical... Right. So that came about, again, saying yes to things uh, that either scare you or you have no idea. Because if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And if people look at it as a failure, well, why do you care what people say? So I was working on a mystery, and a friend of mine who's a guitar player said, oh, I work for this Italian guy, and he wants to, um, he wants to get into publishing. He's going to pay writers to write these stories about famous Italian-Americans uh, today and historically. I said, great. He goes, uh, so I put your name in. I said, I don't write that stuff. No, I'm a mystery guy. And he said, well, he's paying $20,000. And I said, I write that stuff. <laughs> I, I, that's all I ever write. <laughs> so he said, you have to just um, submit an outline and um, our table of contents. And if he goes with it, then uh, they give you half the money up front. You write the book. And if they OK the finished manuscript, you get the other half. So I sent in my table of contents, which I think was four or five pages, and they came right back and said, there's not enough here. There's no there there. <laughs> and uh, they said, here's your last shot. We'll send you a table of contents from another book, just so you can see. And I thought, ah, and it was like 25 pages. So I said, OK, mine's going to be 26. <laughs> and then I sent in mine, which was 27 pages. <laughs> And they said, okay, and that's how I did the Angelo Dundee. And he was like Muhammad Ali's boxing trainer and George Foreman when he made his comeback. And, and that went very well. So, uh, Were they nonfiction? It was, it's like a novel based on the life of. And that's how they, that was their, um, that's what they wanted. Uh, which was good because I started writing the book and I thought, um, well, I can't do a biography. Like, at least I don't really know how to do one. And they said, no, 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 we want a novel. And I said, ah, okay. So, but I was nervous all the way through. I just kept thinking, I'm going to have to return that 20000 which was in my savings for 28 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have to return the money. Oh, and so the second book I wrote with him was on uh, football coach Vince Lombardi. And I was talking to, um, his name is Robert Barbera, and he, it's the publisher's called Mentoris. And we're just having a chat, and Robert at the time was in his early 80s. And um, he said, you know, it's, it's a shame we didn't get that Lombardi book done. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, oh, we had an author. And they wrote the book, but they said we weren't allowed to edit it. We weren't allowed to touch it. I said, but you're the publisher. He goes, that's what we said. So he took his book and his advance, and he walked. And I said, well, I used to play football, and I've already written a book for you guys. I will rescue that book. And I said, I'll do it for half price. He goes, sold. And I said, oh, can I do it for full price? <laughs> so I thought, Jonathan... So, lessons learned. <laughs> My excitement got me in trouble again. But um, I figured that's not bad. Two books, $30,000. That's pretty that's good for, bad, for writing. Yeah, so it's a lot more than I've made with it from my mysteries so far. <laughs> but now that I have a J, look out. <laughs> yes? Well, I'm having trouble getting over the fact that you can write two books in one year. <laughs> Um, but you do all these other things. Yes, yeah, so I uh, became a schedule guy and a list guy because um, 
I, I'm, a, I'm a fitness trainer, but I don't work out of a gym. I either, well, now it's Zoom because of the pandemic, but either I would take my stuff to people's homes, my gear, or they would come to me. Same with, with uh, drum lessons. So I always had holes in my schedule and I'd write in between, but even if I had three or four hours, I would think, okay, this, you know, I'm going to write right now after I have something to eat and after I do the laundry and maybe I should exercise and I'll just play drums for, and I realized, <laughs> oh, I only wrote for 30 minutes of that four hour window. So I would actually, on Sundays, I would look at my week calendar and I would write in the word writing and that's so much easier to hold yourself accountable when you wrote it down because you're just going to feel so bad if you just keep scratching out oh didn't make it today didn't make it today and you'll be surprised how much time you can find and even if you if set uh, your alarm and say okay I, I'm, I'm going to start in the morning I know a lot of writers have a specific time that they write um, I'll write any time because I think I think of the I want this book done or I want I want this book done in four months or five months or something like that so um, I have been I, I think the other part is I'm so I did not expect to have the kind of passion for something like I did with drums and I'm at the point now that I enjoy writing more than I remember liking drums so uh, you know, having all these, this folder with the ideas in it, you know, I can just, okay, I've got nothing right now, then I'll go to that. But I do find either through insomnia or going for walks. Walks are a really good time to write in your head. And uh, comedian John Cleese, who's written a few books, he says he does most of his writing uh, away from the laptop, walking and just thinking. So, yeah. yeah. So it seems to me that a lot of the things that you were talking about, from my perspective, mm -hmm. are output. Output. Pers output. Yeah. Personal training, writing, mm -hmm. um, drumming, mm -hmm. performing. What is your input? Or have you reached that magical point where that output is input? I mean, how do you replenish yourself when you have so much going out? Oh. How do you refill? Okay, the, Maddie's asking, this is a lot of output, so wh what's the input? How do you fill your tank? Um, spending time with my wife. We don't have kids, so we, um, we do a lot of little getaways, walks, and things like that. Uh, that's a, a big input, and doing what we love is the input, because I absolutely just love what we're doing. And then trying new things, because that keeps the mind sharp, the challenge yourself. So I um, got into audiobook narration. And uh, I was hired, or actually, yeah, I was hired to narrate the book that I wrote on Angelo Dundee. And I got through the, I sent them the sample, they said okay. I went all the way through the book and sent it to them, and they rejected it. And I was like, ah. Oh. And I thought, okay. What do I need to do? Ah, I need to go to somebody who knows, uh, a mentor, somebody. So I found a coach, a wonderful woman named Erin Moon in Vancouver. And uh, I read some stuff for her. And she's, she goes, oh, there's a lot of potential here, but here's what you need. And so I took a few sessions and a few more and a few more <laughs> and worked with her for about a year. And uh, it was really tough. And, which was good. I liked the challenge and it made my writing so much better because now everything is out loud and I remember it clicked one day when she gave me a script and it's not labeled who it's written by, it's something, I don't know what it was and I kept getting uh, tripped up on this, this paragraph three, four times and I asked her, do you know, you know what the F is wrong with me? And she said, hang on, it, it is kind of tricky. And then we both looked at it, and then we both said, ah, it's not very well written. I said, ah. I said, okay. So it's not just the tongue twister. It's, it's this. And I said to her, you know, I find that my writing, I'm writing faster now that I'm doing all this narrating. And she said, oh, you, you will discover your editors are going to love you. You're, you're going to get... 
pages back with a lot less red ink because, um, well, you're going to know so many more stories, especially if you're staying in mystery. But read everything out loud. So I read every single thing out loud that I write. Uh, because often to the eye, and it, it looks right, and it's, it's proper, perfect English, but bringing in music again, when you read it out loud, it has to flow, it has to have a rhythm. And that's the kind of stuff you bring in, or I would, like on a third draft or something like that. Because um, we all know the first draft is really just getting the idea down. It's don't get hung up on trying to write beautiful prose on your first draft. Just get it down. And sometimes when yeah, I look at a sentence, I'm like, what am I... Is it my vocabulary? Is there a word missing? Well, they just read it out loud, and it's like, oh, actually, just switch the structure around, and then there you go. Okay, <laughs> Maddie. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've I've read um, a couple of your books, and uh oh, yeah, she's read a couple uh, of my books, and the writing, uh, and you touched on this, so it's this isn't <laughs> earth shattering, but it seems to have. Um, a flow to it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if rhythm is the right word. Okay. But it seems to to move. And do you do you listen to music while while you write, or do you? It has a, I guess a lyricism to it. Mm. Um, I think that's luck. But so uh, Maddie said that she's read a few of my books, and there's a, a flow there. And and one of the things she asked is, do I listen to music? And yes, and it's kind of crazy because I will listen to Chopin or listen to very hard rock or silence. It just depends on the mood and, and the scene at the time. Uh, and my wife says, how can you listen to something with lyrics when you're writing? Mm -hmm. And I think it's because as a drummer we use our hands and our feet. So when you talk about right brain and left brain, I think I have four brains, not just two. <laughs> So yeah, the, the lyrics don't get in, in the way, and it's just, um, I don't know, the music is in the background, it's like a security blanket, I guess. And sometimes what I like, different times of day, um, in the morning is one type of writing. Sometimes I'll write uh, before dinner, and that will be with Chopin and like a Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> And uh, sometimes the rock scene will be on the weekend, and it'll be a beer with the rock and roll. <laughs> but lately I've been doing more of the silence. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I've, I'll be writing like for an hour, and I'm like it's just too quiet. Like I'm going insane, even though I'm enjoying what I'm writing, and I have to put something on. Or take a break and just listen to music. So, but the flow, I definitely, as a kid, and just a lot of movies, and a lot of people say, oh, I could see this as a movie. And that's because I'm very influenced by movies and then reading a ton of books. And that's another thing that I learned from Harlan, Harlan Coleman and Connolly and a lot of crime fiction writers is you have to read a lot. And I can attest to that. He reads so, I, I would, how many books a month? Probably three or four books a month. Yeah. But that's, and again, I read two books at the same time or... <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the mood, because I think it's no different from you watch one show on Netflix and then you move and watch another show on Amazon Prime. <laughs> uh, okay. Sure. So we writers uh, sit a lot, mm -hmm. and they don't um, like you don't find a lot of writers that are personal trainers. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of fitness? Uh, clues or tips can you give people who write to help keep them healthy? Ah, okay, so uh, Repeat the question. We, the, so the question is, as writers we sit a lot, and do I have any tips as a trainer um, how we can stay loose? And uh, <laughs> yeah, Because yeah, loose. especially when you really get on a groove, you don't even notice the time. So obviously you have to have a good chair and you have to think about your posture. Or it's got to be in your subconscious, second nature. You know, don't lean any way, in any direction at all. And often from sitting, you'll get, I used to get this because I was always sitting at the drum set. So you get tight hip flexors and tight hips. So a good thing to do right at your chair 
is to cross yeah. one leg and then lean forward and that will really open up that hip. But as a maintenance thing, um, I do a lot of yoga and I am, it's very humbling and I'm not getting better. <laughs> And I was talking to my narrator coach, who's also a yoga instructor. And I said, ah, I could do these poses in my 40s. And I've just, I was hoping to be at doing advanced poses now. And I did a whole year of yoga. And I think I'm just standing still, you know, like a tree pose. But, <laughs> and she said, she kind of laughed. And she said, well, at our age, and I'm 57, and she's probably 40. But she said, our, at our age, by doing the yoga, we're actually doing maintenance. I said, ah, because that's true. If I wasn't doing any yoga, yeah, I'd be sore when I get out of bed and, and definitely sore from sitting and writing a lot. So um, I do Tai Chi as well because, I mean, I do like that woo-woo stuff <laughs> as well as the ballistic stuff. I still hit the heavy bag and kick the bag. My wife and I, we have martial art background, so um, that's a lot of the mind-body connection and stuff which also work, helps with the discipline because uh, we do um, uh, Hapkido, which is Korean karate, and that was very difficult for me in the early stages because it took flexibility and I wasn't flexible. And uh, talk about doing something over and over and over again. So that, again, with sports and that doing hard things that you're not good at, uh, once you sit down to write and you want to write, the writing is easy because <laughs> this is actually what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then if, if you know you're going to write for three, three hours, get up for five minutes every, get up every hour and stretch. Even if you walk around your room, do something. You've got to because that is a lot of sitting. And uh, in the, when I'm in the narrating booth, most narrators sit while I stand because I think that's going to make my legs stronger. And, but then I, I will stop after 40, 45 minutes and get out of the booth and sometimes get, get on the mat stretch and get back in there. But yeah, no, I think we are built to move. They often say the chair is the worst thing that we've ever done for ourselves. <laughs> so yeah, body in motion stays in motion. So. Uh, Okay. What's up? Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I don't think I have. Um, yeah. Do um, I have one more? Can I? Can are, am I getting pulled? Am I getting yeah, yanked? Yeah. yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, but I have uh, one more question. Okay. Uh -huh. So um, actually, I have a lot more questions. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so when when you um, have your mindset, mm -hmm. how do you uh, stay positive and not get down on yourself if you don't make your goals? Okay. She asked. Uh, how do you stay positive if you don't make your goals, meet your goals, or, um, and that you happens. You set them really low. So yeah, you can, you can set them low, and then you can just be the winner, and then you sound like a former president of ours when you, everything's the best, and the, <laughs> people are saying I'm the best. No. So, <laughs> uh, you, there's a lot of goals you're not going to make because your goal is often a prediction, too. I think I can get this book done in four months, or I think I can do it in five. And if you miss it, it's just one of those things. Okay, I missed that date, but now set a, set a new date. But if you, keep set, if you keep moving the goalposts, then obviously, you know, don't lie to yourself. Lie to other people. Yeah. <laughs> lie in your books. It's always good advice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Is there work you've started that you said to heck with this and thrown it and went on to something else? Uh, he asked, is there work that I've started and, and chucked it out? Uh, I love that question. I'm working on a book now that is taking me uh, longer than any other book. And I'm going to stick with it. And it's because I don't know if you've read On Writing by Stephen King? Sure. Yeah. And he has that story where he was working on a book or, and he, he scrapped it. He actually took the paper out of the typewriter and threw it in the garbage. And when he came back to the typewriter the next day, his wife had taken it out of the garbage and put it on his desk. And she left a note saying, stick with this one. I think you have something. And I think that turned out to be the book Carrie. Oh, yeah. wow. 
And then he said the moral of the story for him was just because it's difficult doesn't mean you throw it away. You might have something there. So that's up to you to know if it's good or not, you know, compare it to your previous work because we always try to write a better book. I mean, I do, you know, that's what I thought. I don't really think about agents and big fives and all that stuff. I just want to write the best book I can and just make the, each book better than the last one. I did the same thing when I played, laid tracks in the studio or when I used to race. I always raced the clock, not the other runners. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, one more. In the, uh, go ahead. What's the best location to get your books? Uh, the best location, uh, um, I guess, would be Amazon, but I have some here today, <laughs> thanks to Maddie. Uh, and barnesandnoble.com as well. Yes, how did you, what is the key to making your key characters? Because when you have a private eye or you have mm -hmm. a detective, they have to be dynamic. Yeah, he asked, what's the key to having your um, characters dynamic and likable and lovable and, and all that stuff? And when I first started writing, I thought it was all about the story because what I learned as a drummer is all about the song, not about me and what I'm playing. So I thought it's about the story until I uh, made a gentleman who was a best-selling author in New York. I made him my mentor. I said, by the way, you don't have a choice. <laughs> and I said, it's all about the story. He goes, no, it's all about the character. I said, oh. And I thought about it. I said, oh, yeah, okay. Think about James Bond, right? You, you might like Connery or you might like Daniel Craig. You, you, we like certain actors. But if you think Bond, you know, he can fight, he gets the girl, he's, he thinks fast on his feet, he has these things that have to be consistent. But if you ever thought back... Um, do you know what happened in each movie? I know I don't, and I've been watching them since the 70s, so, uh, so that's why I thought, oh, it is the character, and it has to be consistent, he has to make mistakes, um, it, all, all, all those things, but I usually, when I come up with a character, I'm, there's a lot of hope, like, I hope you like him, or like her. Um, as Maddie mentioned, this book, Chloe, was the first time I wrote a female protagonist, and I'd been practicing uh, in my other books because I always write, I often write strong female characters, and often they can fight and they can kick a lot of ass because I like strong women. I married a strong woman, and my mother was a very strong woman as well. So, and I cannot stand when Hollywood just does that damsel in distress crap. I I hated that as a kid. I I was talking to my sister about that. I said, remember, it used to be the typical woman running through the woods, and she trips on a branch, and then the guy. I thought, why? Oh, I know why. Oh, screaming. I thought, oh, because everyone that was in charge of that story was male, right? <laughs> so I thought, um, I came up with this character, because many years ago when I was in uh, high school, I think uh, I was 16 years old, and... I had a very pretty girlfriend. So much that I thought that she was out of my league, I couldn't believe that she agreed to be my girlfriend. And in those days, when you're in high school, the pretty girl, they had everything, you know? The, the, you know, the teachers, they were just almost like celebrities in the minds of a 16-year-old boy. And we're walking home from school one day, and one of the older kids came up, and he started hitting on my girlfriend. And I knew him... I knew his reputation. He was a really tough guy, and he was kind of a bad guy. And he was a couple years older than me. And one thing I noticed was my girlfriend was really uncomfortable. And I'd never seen that before, that the celebrity, you know, pretty girl, uh, uncomfortable. And I thought, this is a lot of male, unwanted male attention. And, you know, how would it go if I wasn't there? And then I thought, oh, well, I am here, so now I need to mix it up with this guy, and I can only take him if I get the jump. So I'm thinking of my moves. <laughs> and somehow we ended up having a conversation and diplomatically got out of there. But it, my girlfriend was rocked for a while. And um, so my character, Chloe, um, I wanted to have a girl that gets unwanted male attention 
and is she going to be a victim or is she going to fight back? I have her fighting back. So just I, I'd like to read a little bit from it, but Chloe is um, 17 years old, is four months away from, or sorry, about a month away from graduating high school. She's mixed race, her father's black, and died by suicide. He was a, he was a vet. And that sent the mother off the deep end, and she, you know, turned to alcohol. So Chloe lives with her mother and actually looks after her mother. But Chloe's highly intelligent, and she wants to travel and see the world. So she's torn between looking after her mother and living her own life. And the town is this fictitious Northern California town with sort of, think of like Longmire. It has a bit of a cowboy element to it. There are some horses. And then there's a sheriff, Jim Boulder, and uh, he's like a father figure to Chloe. And uh, some bad actors with bad intentions come for the sheriff, and Chloe sort of gets in there as a meddler and wants to help. Uh, and her life at home is her mother often goes out to the bars and brings home these blue collar drunk workers that uh, once they see Chloe, oh, they want the younger, hotter version and they often make advances. So she develops a, uh, a penchant for knives. She, be she becomes very skillful with knives. She also car does carvings to, to, you know, to stay calm. But uh, she's not going to let anybody uh, mess with her. So I just want to read a little section here from the beginning. Uh, I should say, my parents did a very good job raising me. And I do have good manners. But I do write crime fiction and noir, so there is going to be some colorful language here. It's not my parents' fault, it's mine. <laughs> and the scene is uh, self-explanatory, you'll know what's happening. <clears throat> it was a totally vivid dream because it was about something that had happened to me not long ago. He had long, greasy hair that flowed over pointy, broad shoulders. His teeth were yellow-brown, the ones he had, anyway. I don't know how Mama could have kissed that mouth, let alone do anything else with the pig. I was sick to my stomach at the sight and smell of him. Mama always brought home drunks, but this one smelled not only of cheap booze, but of days, if not weeks, since a bar of soap had been anywhere near his emaciated body. I hated Mama in those moments loathed, actually. They'd kept me up all night with their disgusting pleasure sounds. I thought drunks were supposed to do it once and then pass out. <laughs> oh well, fuck my life. The next day I was at the sink filling up the coffee pot when he slid in behind me, reached around and grabbed my tits. Whoa, fuck off, I said, throwing my head backwards. It connected with his chin and bottom lip. He wiped the blood with the back of his hand. His sinister laugh cut like barbed wire down my spine. What the hell's going on? Mama came out of the bedroom with a ton of sleep in her eyes. I didn't bother answering. She knew damn well what happened. It always happened. Greasy hair ignored Mama as well. She moved to him, looking for a kiss or a hug, any form of affection that said he loved her, at least for now. Instead, he came at me again. This time I had Norma Jean out of the scabbard and in my hands. He came in with arms outstretched and hands aiming for my face. Or maybe my throat. Who knows? I sidestepped and brought my blade across and down. He screamed as the tips of three fingers tumbled into the sink. With his good hand he clutched at the injured one and called me all kinds of names. Even threatened to kill me. Mama unleashed an unintelligible litany of shit before she read the thought in my eyes. Mothers can do that. She hustled to the sink, but I hip-checked her out of the way. She stumbled to walk forward and collided with her lover. I got to the sink and looked back at them. I shoveled the fingertips into the disposal hole and stood with my hand on the switch. No, please don't, honey, he whimpered. Uh, I'm sorry. With a giant smile, I said, whoopsie. I then flipped on the garbage disposal. Greasy hair howled, no, and ran to the sink. 
I leaped out of the way. He turned off the disposal, but we all know, knew he was too late. Sucks to be you, Stubby, I said. <laughs> Mama put her face in her hands and cried. Useless. The greasy-haired bastard motioned like he was coming for me. With legs bent, I swung Norma Jean back and forth in tight figure eights. I said nothing, but my face urged him to try me. His face twisted and contorted as he considered his options. Blood seeped through the fingers of his good hand. He glanced at the crimson pool forming at his feet. You better run along, Stubby, I said. He hesitated a moment. Mama kept crying. You crazy bitch, he said and bolted out the front door. His truck roared to life and he was gone. The dream went wacky after that. Suddenly I was drowning, suffocating actually in a room full of bloody fingertips. I bolted upright. My tank top was covered in sweat and my heartbeat pounded in my ears. Slowing my breathing, I eased Norma Jean from beneath my pillow and kissed the five inch blade near the serrated portion. Good girl. <laughs> so don't mess with Chloe, and you know, you can see. <laughs> we have Chloe here if they want to buy Yes, Chloe's here for sale. Um, if you like uh, badass. Uh, <laughs> don't mess with her. When my publisher read it, uh, she began the book and she said, uh, you know, I was going to ask you why you didn't make this a young adult book. And then she said, but as the story went on, it's definitely a very grown-up story. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> I said, I don't know anything about YA and millennials and Gen Zs. And I don't know if there's a tone coming through my voice. <laughs> but no, she's, she's, yeah, she's definitely, um, she's similar to me because I'm young. I'm youngest of three and I'm six years behind my brother. So I always hung around with older people. So she's has a lot of that, uh, well, has to grow up fast because of all her, her mother, it, you know, her home life, and also spends time with the sheriff and in this big crime world. So she's growing up fast, and yet she still has the youthful cockiness of being a teenager, and then gets in over her head when she's playing on the, on the big boy field. So there's a lot going on with Chloe.